Author Johan Hari traveled across the globe researching how different jurisdictions deal with drug addiction and legislate against drug use. Well, one of those locations was Vancouver, where new approaches are addressing issues of drug addiction, particularly in that city's downtown east side. And with that, we welcome back to our program Johan Hari, the author of Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. Welcome back. Great to be with you. Okay, so yesterday we talked about the origins, uh, the evolution of the war on drugs. Today I want to talk about um, sort of the implications and, and what different jurisdictions are doing about the drug war, particularly Vancouver. So most Canadians um, know about Vancouver's east side. Most Canadians have never set foot in Vancouver's east side. You have. Describe what you saw there. What I discovered there is a story that every Canadian should be incredibly proud of. Something has happened in the downtown east side that is inspiring people all over the world. And it really began in this incredible story of a man I got to know. In the year 2000, there was a homeless street addict on the downtown east side called Bud Osborne. And he was watching his friends die all around him. People would use behind dumpsters, shoot up so that the cops wouldn't see them. But obviously, if you're hiding so that no one can see you and you start to OD, no one can see you and you die. So Bud thought, look, I can't go on just seeing all my friends fall one by one. But he also thought, look, I'm a homeless street addict. What can I do? And he had a very simple idea. Got together a bunch of the addicts and he said, let's, just between us, not any officials or anything like that, let's just arrange a timetable and we'll just patrol the alleyways when we're not using. And if we spot someone who's ODing, we'll call an ambulance. Really simple idea. They started to do it. Within a few months, the overdose rate started to really significantly fall in, in Vancouver on the downtown east side. And obviously that was a good thing in itself, but also it meant the addicts kind of started to think about themselves a little bit differently. They were like, ah, oh, maybe we're not the pieces of rubbish people say, maybe we're people who can save people's lives. They started to go to the public meetings about like the menace of the addicts, mm. and they would sit at the back, and they'd hear you know, people talking about how awful they were, and somewhere along the line, one of them, like Bud, would put up their hand and go, I think you're talking about us. Is there anything we could do differently? And sometimes people would be very angry. Sometimes they'd be kind of impressed. One of the things people would say is, oh, you leave your needles lying around. So Bud said, that's fine. We'll extend the patrol. We'll collect the needles as well. And they started to do that. Around that time, Bud did some research in the library in downtown East Side, And he learned that in Frankfurt, in Germany, they had opened safe injecting rooms, which were places where you could legally go and you could use heroin there and you could be monitored by doctors. And the overdose rate had massively fallen. And Bud thought, right, we've got to have that in, in here. Nothing like it had happened in North America right since the start of the drug wars since the stuff we were talking about yesterday. And yet Bud thought it had to happen. So him and his friends, who by that time had formed a group called Vandu, Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, it was really substantial, hundreds of people. They started to stalk the mayor of Vancouver. It was a man called Philip Owen, who was a rich right-wing businessman from a very wealthy family who'd said that all the addicts should be taken and detained at the local military base, which sort of gives you some idea of what his politics were. I think of him as being a bit like Mitt Romney. He just had no idea about people's lives. And they follow him around for two years and they carry with them a coffin. And the coffin says something like, Philip Owen, who will die next before you open a safe injecting room? And all the while it's happening, huge numbers of people are dying. It was the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing into the downtown east side once every two years, full of people. And they get a bit disheartened because nothing's changing. And one day, enormously to his credit, Philip Owen just thinks, who the hell are these people? Mm. And he goes incognito to the downtown east side and he spends time with addicts. And he's totally blown away. He had no idea their lives were like this. And he goes to meet Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, who was very good on the drug war, partly because he'd grown up under prohibition in Chicago, alcohol prohibition. And Philip Owen comes back and he holds a press conference. And he has the coroner, he has the chief of police, and he has an addict there. And he effectively says, we're going to open the first safe injecting room in North America. We're going to have the most compassionate drug policies in North America. And things are going to change. And they open Insight, the first safe injecting room in North America, which I went to. It's a bit like Tony and Guy. It looks like these little <laughs> lit boobs, except you don't, you don't have your hair cut. You shoot up. With doctors there and people there so that when you're ready to stop, they're there to support you. You're given constant love and support and attention and care and clean needles to make sure you don't contract HIV or hepatitis C. Philip Owen's party was so appalled they deselected him. But he was replaced by a... The, the right-wing candidate was then defeated by a more liberal candidate who won. Ten years on, by the time I went there, the results were in. Deaths from overdose are down by 80% on the downtown east side, 80%. And average life expectancy is up by 10 years. That is extremely hard to find anywhere in the world, an improvement in life expectancy of 10 years. And 
Philip Owen said to me when I went and met him, it was the proudest thing he ever did. And he would sacrifice his political career all over again. And Bud, who started this uprising, died last year. He was only in his early 60s, but he had been a homeless addict during a drug war. It takes a toll on you. And when he died, they sealed off the streets of the downtown east side where he had lived. And they had this incredible memorial service for him. And there were a lot of people in that crowd who knew they were alive because of what Bud had started. And it really helped me to think about lots of things. It's very easy when you're confronted with something huge like the drug war to think, what can we do? This has been going on for 100 years. We're never going to change it. Bud was a homeless street addict. And he started an uprising. You start where you stand that has saved hundreds, if not thousands, mm. of lives. You know, the Canadian Supreme Court has now found, as a direct result of that activism, that uh, drug users have an inalienable right to life, and that means that they cannot shut down insight. I would say to anyone watching this, you are so much more powerful than you know. If you have a voice, a human voice, you can appeal to people and you can persuade them, and you can achieve things that seem impossible. There's still some controversy over inside. Sure. Not everyone ha ha has bought into it. I mean, I guess my question is, if, if the evidence is so good, I'm not saying it's not, why haven't we seen more of this? In, inside, as you say, it's been, it's been around from 2015 to open in 2000, I think. Why haven't we seen more of these open up? Well, it's really fascinating. I went to lots of places that have moved beyond the drug war model, and the pattern is always the same. It's introduced in a context of incredible controversy. Uh, there's very strong concerns that are very understandable. And then things change quite quickly. The most exciting example is Portugal. In the year 2000, Portugal had the, one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is kind of incredible. And every year, they tried more and more the American way. They arrested more people. They imprisoned more people. And every year, the problem got worse. And one day, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together. And they said, look, we can't go on like this. We're of the country with 1% of people addicted to heroin. What can we do? So, they agreed to set up a panel of scientists, doctors, and judges. And they said to this panel, come back and tell us what would genuinely solve this problem. And we have agreed in advance that whatever you recommend, we'll do. So it just took it out of politics. The panel goes away, led by an incredible man called Dr. Hua Gulao, who'd set up the first rehab center in Portugal. And it comes back after, I think it was about a year and a half, and it says, decriminalize everything, from cannabis to crack. But, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on arresting drug users, trying drug users, imprisoning drug users, take all that money and spend it on really good, A, really honest drug, drug education for kids, and B, really good drug treatment. And what's fascinating about it is that it's not really what we think of as drug treatment in North America. So they do do rehab, they do do psychological support that has real value. But the biggest part of it is about reconnecting addicts with society. If you think about it right, we, we've got glasses of water here, right? Forget the drug laws. They could be full of vodka, perfectly legally. You and me, we could be drunk now, right? We could spend most of our lives drunk. We don't, right? I've only met, I've met you before, but I'm guessing <laughs> you don't spend most of your life drunk, right? Why? Because we've got something we want to be present in our lives for. Because we've got jobs we love. We've got people we love. We want to be present in the world. We don't want to be out of it. The goal of the Portuguese decriminalization was to make sure that every addict in Portugal woke up with something to do that day, with something to be present for in the world. So the biggest part of the program was subsidized jobs and subsidized loans to set up businesses. So say you used to be a mechanic, you, you developed a drug problem. When you're ready, they'll go to a garage and they'll say, if you employ her for a year as a mechanic, we will pay half her wages, right? Or groups of addicts were given loans to set up removals firms and all sorts of things. It's now been, it'll be 15 years soon since this program was introduced. The results are in. Injecting drug use is down by 50%, 5-0%. Every study shows addiction is significantly down, overdose is significantly down, HIV transmission among addicts is significantly down. And the way you know it's been a real success is Portugal has a very competitive political system. There is no political party that wants to go back. And I, one of the most moving interviews I did for the book was with a guy called Juan Figuera, who was the top drug cop in Portugal. He led the opposition to the decriminalization. And he said a lot of the things that a lot of your viewers will totally understand and be thinking, well, they hear me say this, right? Surely if you decriminalize all drugs, you'll have an explosion in drug use, you'll have all sorts of problems. And what he said to me, I'm paraphrasing the exact words are in the book, but he said, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. And he talked about how he felt ashamed that he'd spent 20 years arresting and harassing drug users. 
and he really hoped the whole world followed Portugal's example. Nowhere that's moved beyond the drug war regrets it. Okay, so let me ask you that though. If, if again, insight hasn't been replicated en masse um, in our country or elsewhere, Portugal, the experience there has not been replicated in other jurisdictions en masse around the world. So why not? I think if we were sitting here in 1963 when virtually every country in the world made it a crime to be gay, we would have said, well, why is nowhere dealing with it? Because people hadn't organized and bound together and persuaded their fellow citizens yet. And the drug war is built on totally understandable fears. This isn't like, actually, this is where the gay analogy breaks down. At the end of the day, with homophobes, at the end of the day, have a f people who believe in the equality of gay people just have a fundamental disagreement with comfort, there's nothing we can do. One of the things that's fascinating to me about prohibitionists and about people who believe in the drug war, it's actually the things they want, of course there's race-based elements which are uh, unpleasant, and that's not most prohibitionists. Most prohibitionists believe in the drug war because they don't want kids to use drugs, they don't want people to become addicted, and they don't want criminality. I agree with every part of that. I think they are absolutely right in what they long for. It's just that their methods of getting there actually make the problem worse and there's a different way that makes it better. So I actually think the kind of differences are rather narrow on this question. And it's partly because people like me haven't done a good enough job of explaining that to prohibitionists and haven't done a good enough job of explaining the places where they've moved beyond the war on drugs. Like, for example, Switzerland, where I went, where they've legalized heroin for addicts or Colorado and Washington where they've legalized marijuana for recreational users. So it's partly just about doing a much better job of explaining the things they fear about ending the drug war are things they're right to be afraid of and they're not things that happen when you do end the drug war. I want to unpack some other um, assumptions mm. that we have about drug use and addiction. And one of them is, um, is the argument that drugs simply cause ad addiction. We hear this all the time. We hear the debate in our country that, you know, it's the ramping up. You start with this and then you go to the next one and then soon enough you're an addict. Debunk that for me from what you've learned and, and said in your book. This was some of the stuff that most blew my mind and I had no idea about. If you had said to me four years ago, what causes, say, heroin addiction? I would have looked at you like you were a little bit simple-minded <laughs> and I would have said heroin causes heroin addiction, right? It's kind of obvious. We've been told a story for 100 years about addiction that has become our common sense and it seems kind of obvious. We think if the next 20 people to walk past this studio all used heroin together for 20 days, because there are chemical hooks in heroin, their body would at the end of it physically need the heroin and that's what addiction is, right? The first uh, realization that there might be some problem with that theory came when it was explained to me by Gabor Mate, an extraordinary doctor on the downtown east side, former doctor. Um, if you or me step out of this studio today and we're hit by a car and we break our hip, we'll be taken to hospital, we'll be given a lot of diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's much stronger heroin than you'd ever get on the streets because it's medically pure. We'll be given it for quite a long period of time. Anyone watching this, anywhere in Canada, there is a hospital near you giving loads of people lots of heroin, right? Now, if what we believe about addiction is true, what should happen? Those people should leave hospital as addicts. You know, you will have noticed your grandmother did not become a junkie because of a hip operation. I kind of thought, ah, oh, that doesn't happen. There must be something else going on here, but I couldn't really make sense of it until I went and interviewed a genuinely heroic Canadian. Um, I'm not saying this just to suck up to Canadians. It's all in the book <laughs> that there are lots of heroic Canadians in it. A man called Bruce Alexander, who's a professor on the downtown east side. And Bruce explained to me, this theory we have about addiction, the one that we all implicitly believe, comes from an experiment that was done earlier in the 20th century. It's a really simple experiment. People watching it at home can do it themselves if they're feeling a little bit sadistic. You get a rat and you put it in a cage and give it two water bottles. One is just water and one is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself. So you think, there you go, that's addiction. That's how it works. Bruce came along in the 70s and said, hang on a minute, we're putting the rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do except use the drugs. Let's do this differently. So Bruce built Rat Park. Rat, rat Park, park yeah. Rat Park is heaven for rats, right? <laughs> Anything a rat could want, it's got in Rat Park. It's got nice food, it's got coloured balls, it's got friends, it can have loads of sex. Anything a rat wants, it's there. And they've got both the water bottles, the drugged water and the normal water. But the fascinating thing is, in Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They hardly ever use it. None of them ever overdose. None of them ever use it in a way that looks compulsive or addictive. There's an interesting human example that I can tell you about in a minute. But what Bruce says is this shows us that both the right wing and the left wing theories of addiction are wrong. The right-wing theory of addiction is, you know, it's a moral failing, you party too hard, you're a hedonist, that's how you get into it. The left-wing theory is, it takes you over, it hijacks your brain, it's like a brain disease. What Bruce says is, it's not your morality, it's not your brain, it's your cage. 
Addiction is an adaptation to your environment. Human beings have an innate need to bond. That we will, and healthy human beings bond with other people, uh, people who can do that. If you can't bond with other people because you're physically cut off or you're emotionally cut off or you're traumatized or you're beaten down by life, you will bond with something that gives you some sense of relief or pleasure. Now that might be pornography, that might be a roulette wheel, that might be cocaine, it might be alcohol, but it will be something. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And what Bruce says, and I think what I reflected on learning from him is, that shows really partly the flaws in the drug war, that we have a model that's built on cutting people off even further, making them suffer even more. And then we think they're gonna stop. Gabor Mate said to me, if you wanted to build a system that would keep people addicted, you would build the system that we have now. Actually, I think it has much deeper and wider meaning for our society. You know, we've created a society where a lot of our fellow citizens can't bear to be present in their lives, mm. can't bear to get through the day without being medicated. We've made life a lot more like that first cage and a lot less like Rat Park. The effect of that is rising addiction. It doesn't have to be this way. We can change the way we live. Well, let me ask you a hypothetical. Say you removed all the, the heroin from Vancouver's downtown east side. Took it away. What would happen to those addicts? Oh, we don't have to ask theoretically. In the 1970s, when the French connection was broken, so the supply route into the United States, into North America, was broken. There was a period, again, I learned about this from Bruce Alexander, where no heroin got through for quite a long time. I think it was three or four months. We know that because the police would seize the heroin and they'd obviously, heroin in inverted commas that was being sold, and they'd test it and it just didn't have any heroin in it. It had some chopped up Valium, but nothing else. And what's fascinating is if you believe the drug war theory, what should have happened? All these addicts should have been liberated from their addiction. They should have gone into withdrawal. They should have woken up, you know, delighted that they were free. What actually happened is everything carried on exactly the same. The addicts knew it was weak, they took a bit more Valium, but actually the addicts carried on prostituting themselves or robbing, the dealers carried on selling. Pretty much nothing changed because they were trying to deal with the pain in their lives. Mm. They were trying to deal with this underlying pain. The chemical, it's not that the chemical is nothing, there's actually an experiment that some of your viewers will have taken part in that tells us how much is the chemical. This chemical is a minor element. One of the ways we know that is through nicotine patches. We know that one of the most chemically, one of the things that causes the most physical cravings, drugs, is tobacco, right? And we know we can isolate the part of tobacco that's chemically addictive, it's nicotine. So when in the early 90s they invented nicotine patches, there's this huge wave of optimism because they think, oh great, we're gonna be able to give smokers all of the drug they're addicted to, but without the filthy carcinogenic smoke, it's gonna be a huge fall in smoking. Actually, only 17% of smokers who use nicotine patches can stop. Now, 17% is a lot. It's absolutely not nothing. If we could reduce 17% of other drug use, that's a huge amount, we should do it. But you will have noticed that leaves 83% that has to be explained some other way. And the other way is significantly these theories. Mm. And there's interesting human examples of this. Going on at the same time as Rat Park, there was a human experiment exactly into this called the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, 20% of American troops were using a lot of heroin. And if you look at the news reports from the time, there's a real panic. Because they think, my God, when the war ends, we're gonna have hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States. What happened? They came home and almost all of them just stopped. Because if you're taken out of a hellish pestilential jungle where you don't wanna be and you could be killed at any moment, and you go back to your nice life in Wichita, Kansas with your wife and your friends and your job, it's the equivalent of being taken out of the first cage and put into the second cage. You know, that, so this demonstrates that if we want to help people to overcome addiction, and this is something as we talked about yesterday, you know, it was a big factor in my life and in people I love and in my relatives, we have to make life a better place for them to be. Mm. We can't make life worse, that will drive them further into it. And it really made me, help me this journey and, and meeting Bruce and Gabor and Bud and getting to know them, getting to know so many other people. When I went back, I, I thought all about, do you know that? that terrible um, show, Intervention, where they say to addicts, and they get addicts, families and friends together, and they threaten to cut off the addict if he doesn't stop. One of the things I really learned from, from what I learned is that that is the worst way you can react to the addicts in your life. What I did with the addicts in my life is you know, tell them I would never cut them off. And whatever happened, whether they were using or they weren't, I would do my best to love them. And it's hard sometimes to sit with people mm. who are in that state. Anyone watching this will know that. But that's the only thing that ever gets people out of it. Mm. I want to go back a, a, a little bit. I want to play, this is um, a, a clip. It's an anti-drug commercial from the 90s. It's from the Partnership for, for Drug-Free America. Just take a look at this. This is your brain. And this is heroin. 
This is what happens to your brain after snorting heroin. And this is what your body goes through. Wait, it's not over yet. This is what your family goes through. And your friends and your mind. And your drugs. life. Any questions? That's a commercial that I watched when I was a kid a lot. Have you ever seen it? Yeah. Okay. So it, that commercial played in Canada, it played in the U.S., um, or a similar commercial at any rate. It was drilled into our heads as kids that drugs fry your brain. And that message is still being carried out in different ways. Are we too far, um, you know, down that belief, if I can put it that way, are we too freaked out to do anything, um, freaked out by what drugs do, to, to, to humanize this, this story, which you do in your book, to humanize addicts. We talk about Bud, you talk about him like he's a person, but societally, are we just too far down that path to make this about humans anymore? I don't think so, and I think the best evidence is from Switzerland. I'm a Swiss citizen as well as, as you can tell from my voice, a British citizen. Switzerland is a super right-wing country. Switzerland, my Swiss relatives, you know, make Genghis Khan look like a woolly liberal. <laughs> and Switzerland <laughs> has legalized heroin for addicts, right? If you're a heroin addict in Switzerland, you go to your doctor, they will give, send you to a clinic, and you can go into that clinic and they'll give you heroin and you can use it. You can't take it home, but you can use it there. And it's really important to understand how that happened in Switzerland, because I think it's really helpful to think about how we end the drug war didn't happen mainly because of compassion for drug users. As I say, they're not, they're not very compassionate people. What happened was that the president, Ruth Dreyfus, who's an extraordinary woman who I interviewed for the book, explained to people, drug war means anarchy. It means unknown criminals selling unknown chemicals to unknown users all in the dark. It means chaos and violence and disease. Um, and it means our lovely clockwork parks that we love so much are filled with chaos and violent people and users. Legalization is a way of bringing order and regulation to this anarchy and chaos. It means taking drugs away from armed criminal gangs and giving them to nice doctors in white coats who will get the addicts ordered and regulated. And it was fascinating going to those clinics in Geneva and sitting with people. One of things that most interested me about it, actually, is so you, you can stay on that program as long as you want, right? They'll never, cut, they'll never throw you off. And you can set your own dose. You can go in and say how much heroin you want. And I was kind of even, I was a bit surprised by that. Until it was explained to me by the doctor there, Dr. Rita Mangi, that almost all the addicts, once they're given a safe dose and the chaos of being a street user ends, they start to get their life together. They get jobs, they get homes, and they, um, gradually reduce their drug use over time. The vast majority of them, there's almost, it's been running for like 20 years, no, almost no one from the start of the program is still on it, although they could be. The vast majority of people just reduce their dose over time and get their life back mm. together again. So actually prescription is a way to reducing, partly fits with what we learned about Rat Park, their life becomes more bearable. Who's gonna get clean living under a bridge? Who's gonna want to be present in that life? No one. You've got a nice life, you've got a nice job, you're a lot more likely to be, want to be present in your life. You traveled um, around the world uh, researching this book. And, um, you know, in, in Canada and the U.S., this discussion about whether to decriminalize or legalize some drugs sort of ebbs and flows. I'm just wondering, from what you observed in your time spent in North America, in Canada and the U.S., um, how much momentum do you think there is to decriminalize or legalize drugs? Enormous. What happened in Colorado and Washington with the legalization of marijuana, at the heart of the country that has imposed the drug war on the rest of the world, imposed it on Canada, imposed it on Britain, imposed it virtually everywhere. To have it crumble there and to have it crumble so in a way that's worked so well, it's very revealing. You know, 53% of people in Colorado and Washington just over a year ago vo well, voted for it to be legalized just over a year ago. For marijuana to be yeah, legalized. Yeah, for marijuana, yeah. But what's fascinating is, since then, support in those states for legalization has grown and grown. When people see the alternatives, you know, they don't, they don't want it. And it was very important, the campaign in Washington, which I write about a lot in the book, I think was a really important campaign because Tonya Winchester, the superb person who led that campaign, stressed, this is not about saying that you like marijuana, that you want to use marijuana, that you think marijuana is a good thing. It's none of those things. I don't like alcohol. I've never liked it. I drink wine three times a year. It's the only kind of alcohol I ever touch. I don't like the drug. I don't like its taste. I don't like the effect it has on people. I think it makes them stupid. No one would be surprised that having said all that, I'm also against alcohol prohibition. You can hate marijuana. You can think it's a terrible drug 
and still think it's better for it not to be controlled by armed criminal gangs, to be regulated, to be sold by people who are punished if they sell to children, and for people to not go to prison and have their lives ruined for using it. It's very important, these really smart legalization campaigns that are happening, that are about explaining, it's about restoring order. It's yes, it's about compassion for users and addicts, and it's about you know not asking anyone to endorse drugs in any way. Interesting book, lots of great characters. Thank you for sharing some of them with us and, and challenging the narrative that um, we've been told for so long. Appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for asking such smart questions. I'm thrilled. <laughs> Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.